Hello, insatiable listeners. Well, we just finished another rich podcasting season where we looked at the various angles of inconsistency. We are now on a season break until September 18th, when we will be back with a dynamite new season. Mark your calendars for September 18th when we return. Originally, I thought our next season theme would be on fertility, but it's taking some interesting twists and turns. So it's kind of about that and kind of not. Regardless where you are in your menstrual or parenting cycle, next season will get you thinking and aha-ing about how the cycle of life influences our food habits and choices and how we need to harmonize our food and wellness based on where we find ourselves hormonally, emotionally, and spiritually. In the meantime, I hope those of you who feel the call will join us in my live Why Am I Eating This Now group program, which opens for registration on August 5th. Truly, this program is life-changing, and it's the last chance to work with me until March 2020, because I am going on a six-week maternity break (laughs) from whenever this Bambino is born until six weeks out, (laughs) and my private practice is full until April uh, 2020. So you can find details for the Why Am I Eating This Now live group program, which again, it only runs once a year at alishapiro.com backslash why hyphen am hyphen I hyphen eating hyphen this hyphen now hyphen live hyphen group. Okay. And now on to a rebroadcast of some previous insatiable episodes where a second listen is worthwhile. Enjoy. Speaking to what you said about the gut and healing the gut, there's definitely how long it takes for the initial healing is depends on how bad it is, you know, and how sick you are, right? And so that's the first thing for sure. I say six months to two years, depending if you stay on a a very gut healing program and eat gut healing foods. And so there is a food piece to how you want to eat long term. And the interesting, what's lifelong, the interesting thing that is is that there's a lifelong piece to this because to have a healthy gut, you have to eat a food plan, a food program. I don't like calling it a diet. It's making food choices that facilitate a healthy microbiome. Conventionally, every autoimmune disease has been split between different medical specialties, chopped up. So the neurologist is studying MS and the rheumatologist is studying rheumatoid arthritis and the endocrinologist takes care of the thyroid people and the gastroenterologist takes care of the Crohn's and colitis people, you know, and so everybody's in a different place. And so the money for research and the the unification of it all, which what's really happening is is it's an immunology problem. There's a problem with the immune system. And so what in functional medicine, the approach in functional medicine is to trigger, try to figure out the root cause of autoimmunity, right? Well, what's the root cause? Why is the immune system not working right? You know battling food in your body doesn't work. You want to love and accept yourself. And because you're insatiable, you want results too. You bring the same intensity to your life, wanting to maximize your time potential, and experiences you have here on our beautiful and wondrous planet Earth. Fair warning, it will be a roller coaster. But for those insatiable, this is your prime time to thrive. Here's to saying yes to the hunger of wanting it all. I'm your host, Ali Shapiro, who is dedicated to pioneering a saner and more empowering approach to health and weight loss. Welcome to episode 83 of the Insatiable Podcast with Dr. Susan Blum, functional medicine pioneer on healing your gut for chronic disease relief. Most of today's chronic health issues, from psoriasis to depression to Hashimoto's, stem from an autoimmune response in an unhealthy gut. For two decades, Dr. Susan Blum has been providing relief to her patients by getting to the root of their chronic illness through a groundbreaking whole body approach that with precision addresses the physical and emotional roots of these issues. In today's episode, I get the scoop from Dr. Blum on the most effective testing to see if you have gut issues and how this test is also a tool to feeling relief you didn't know was possible. And this is important because not all gut issues show up in your digestive system. 
We'll talk about the nitty gritty details of gut healing, including expected timelines, when pre and probiotics make sense, and how you don't have to eat perfectly to get, be able to get relief. And lastly, we talk about how much stress influences gut issues and how much weight you should give to stress relief in relation to dietary changes. The percentage will surprise you. This also led to a great discussion on Dr. Blum's own spiritual anchors and beliefs that guide her, including her own health challenges she recently had and recovered from. Here's a little bit more about the amazing Dr. Susan Blum. She is a true functional medicine pioneer and is an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Preventative Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. In addition to being a specialist, she is the founder and director of Blum Center for Health in Rye Beck, New York, where she leads a large multi-special team of physicians, nurse practitioners, nutritionists, and health coaches, all providing cutting-edge functional and integrative medicine services. In her first best-selling book, The Immune System Recovery Plan, Dr. Blum offers her four-step program, which she used to help thousands of patients recover from autoimmune and immune-related conditions without medication. She'll have a second book coming out this fall called Healing Off Arthritis, which offers a unique groundbreaking approach to helping arthritis sufferers reverse and he- even heal this program. And we talk a little bit about it on the, the podcast today. She's a member of the Medical Advisory Board for the Dr. Oz Show, the Institute for Integrated Nutrition, and a senior faculty teacher with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C. And she's been seen all over the media on the Dr. Oz shows, Fox 5 News, ABC Eyewitness News, and is regular quoted, regularly quoted in Real Simple, Harper's Bazaar, and Red Book, among other publications. Believe it or not, she has even more credentials, which you can get at our, my website, alishapiro.com backslash podcast. But you're going to love today's episode. It's really going to reframe how you think about health, including how to prioritize your emotional well-being. Enjoy. Welcome, Insatiable listeners. Today, we have such an extra special guest, Dr. Susan Blum. Thank you so much for being here. I, Dr. Blum, I was telling my Truce with Food group that I was interviewing you, and one of my clients was like, oh my God, she, her protocol saved my life. It sounds so cliche, but I was at my, the darkest hour, and she gave me so much hope. And her psoriasis, so many of her autoimmune conditions are healing. And so that's kind of the intro I want to give our listeners, like this one of <laughs> miracles. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's really nice. Yeah, thank you for being here. So you are kind of one, I mean, you're a real pioneer in adopting functional medicine. And, you know, you had your own Hashimoto's experience. So But what I find interesting was that you were board certified in preventative medicine before Hashimoto. So you always had this inkling. And so I'm curious how that transition happened and how you knew to look at food in terms of your Hashimoto's and other autoimmune issues. Well, so again, thank you for having me here. I I really just, I love that. I love hearing stories about how my book or listening to me or hearing me or seeing me speak gave people hope because that's what I hope to do today. You know, just give more information and offer another way just to share what I know and to help give people hope that they don't have to suffer, you know, uh, especially with any kind of complex chronic illness, that there is another way and you can get to the root cause and and treat it. And food is one of those things. Now, how did I learn? And and it's interesting, so many of my colleagues, when I give a talk at, at integrative conferences and I always start out and say, okay, how many of you came to this field of medicine because you had your own autoimmune issue or your own health issue or like what for, how many of you figured this out because you yourself had a problem and at least two-thirds of the audience raises their hand so we we figure this out on ourselves first often and it's what brings us to an opening now you're right me I was already on the path a little bit beforehand because I was already dissatisfied with conventional internal medicine, which is where I started out. I started out in internal medicine. I did my internship and I just thought, you know, this isn't right for me. This is like, there's a, there's a heart attack in room 12 and a GI bleed in room 14. And there was some algorithm for how to treat them. And it's, it's what we call downstream medicine. It's like way downstream. It's when everything's happened and you've seen the end result. And I was really, I now know the term for it. It's called upstream medicine was what I really wanted to practice. But at that time, the only thing I could find, I said, you know, I want to have an influence in how they got here. Like I want to talk to people. I want to help figure out sort of change the story before they're sitting in the room with the heart attack. And the only field that was available was 
sort of this field of preventive medicine and also the a master which is taught in public health schools there's a preventive medicine track in public health schools as well as there's actually a very really and I actually just came this morning from at the Icon Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai they changed their name but at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City I'm on faculty in the preventive medicine department because that's where I did my residency and I we had our a residency advisory committee this morning and um, so I just came from there and as a matter of fact but I really wanted to find a way to do upstream I was interested in nutrition and stress and and so let's do that and the conventional world where I found that I went and did my master's in public health at Columbia and that was great I was interesting you know there was preventive prevention programs and corporate wellness programs they were talking about but there was still no clinical prevention. And so I found a preventive medicine residency, and I did that at Mount Sinai, which is where I'm still affiliated. And that still, that was about immunizations and mammograms and early detection. You know, that's not really primary prevention. Those things, screening programs are secondary prevention. It's after you already have the beginnings of an illness, let's catch it early, and then we could treat you and you could have a better outcome. And that's all wonderful. But true primary prevention is root cause prevention medicine and there was nothing there was nothing so I'm in my preventive medicine program and I'm finishing up and I happen to have had my a child a baby so I had a child it was actually my third kid I was having children all along the way and I said you know what this isn't for me either this isn't it I'm still looking and so I took time off after having my third kid and what happened for me was the first thing so I was already you know, sometimes you just sort of know what you don't want as opposed to really truly knowing what you do. Isn't that true? It's so, I think that's how you figure out what you want. <laughs> exactly. And so I was just doing all these things and figuring out what I didn't want. And in my second year of maternity leave or taking a break, you know, after having kids, across my desk came this invitation, sort of a brochure for the Center for Mind Body Medicine training program for health professionals. And I looked at this thing and I said, I have to go. I, I just knew I had to go. And this, for, this, of course, appeals to the whole stress part, which we're going to talk today about mind, body, and stress, and emotions, and how it affects health. And that was actually the first thing that I did before I had Hashimoto's or was sick was I started out in mind, body, medicine. And in that program, there was nutrition. Discussion. There was nutrition lectures and nutrition discussion. Food is medicine. And the Center for Mind, Body, Medicine actually has a fabulous annual food as medicine program conference that they run for, for people who want to come. Anybody could go. It's health professionals a lot who go, but really it's open to the public and it's called food as medicine. So there was, I started to learn about food as medicine. And in that program, I learned about the Institute for Functional Medicine. And in 2001, I did 1998, I did mind body medicine. And then after doing that for a few years, which really gave me the tools to learn more about myself, and I was able to really figure out that I wanted to do nutrition next. And then I went seeking nutritional medicine training. And I think that's how that all happened. And right at the time that I was diagnosed, gosh, in 2000, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto. So I went and did my functional medicine training right after my diagnosis of Hashimoto's. And I came home and I ordered every test on myself. I ordered, you know, I started, I put myself through the detox programs. I checked my mercury. I, you know, worked on my gut. I did stool tests. I did everything I learned in the, in the functional medicine training. And I sort of worked it all out on myself. And so that's, that's, that's the whole story then, how that all unfolded. I love that. It's because I think sometimes people think, oh, Everyone knows what to do. There's a set way to do things. And it really is a lot about experimentation. And that's one of the things I've, I was in prepping for this interview. You were talking, someone asked you like, well, how long does it take to heal the gut? And you're like, oh, this is a lifetime path. <laughs> Not that you're going to be in acute pain forever, but it's, it's a constant learning. You know, I call it a spiral staircase. Like you get to one view and then you learn something else. And then more and more, kind of like your educational and your own intuitive path led you. Right, exactly. And there's a lifelong aspect to this that's really important. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that this right now because this is, I have a little bug in my bonnet about that these days. <laughs> that's a great term. Bug yeah, I do. I have a bug in my bonnet about that because 
you know, I'm now 15, 16 years out of practicing functional medicine, and I, I'm grateful that I found it, or that I have the experience, right, because I've been doing it a long time. And so many things, so many times we do these jump start. You, you know, you can go online, there's detox programs, 21 day this, 30 day this, two week this, and there's a lot of jump start programs. And I start out with people with a jump start as well, because they'll feel better quickly, and you want that, you know, you get them started. But in my, I have a new book coming out in October called Healing Arthritis. And what I really was passionate about in this book was step three is called finish what you start, you know, finishing what you started. Because healing the gut, and it's very much about healing the gut because arthritis is a whole, the gut arthritis connection. And there's a whole section on food and a whole section on trauma. Okay, so food trauma gut is the whole book. And, about, and then it's leaky gut and how it causes systemic inflammation. But Speaking to what you said about the gut and healing the gut, there's definitely how long it takes for the initial healing is depends on how bad it is, you know, and how sick you are, right? And so that's the first thing for sure. I say six months to two years, depending if you stay on a, a very gut healing program and eat gut healing foods. And so there is a food piece to how you want to eat long term. And the interesting, what's lifelong, the interesting thing that is is that there's a lifelong piece to this because to have a healthy gut, you have to eat a food plan, a food program. I don't like calling it a diet. It's sort of making food choices that facilitate a healthy microbiome. And there's and a standard American diet does not facilitate a healthy microbiome. Too much animal does not facilitate a healthy microbiome. It's food and polyphenol. It's, it's fiber, polyphenols, a lot of vegetables, vegetables, resistant starch that's in legumes, you know. So a lot of people, you know, I'm not anti-paleo, but, you know, if the diet should be more 30% animal and 70% of these vegetable foods as opposed to 70% animal. So you could always do, it's about balance, but there's a way to eat that will support your microbiome. And so, so to the, the finishing what you started after you're healing your gut and then you're moving on, you really need to continually 90% of the time eat in a way that's healing for your gut. And that's the lifelong part. Not that you need to be on a leaky gut diet, restrictive, restrictive for forever. It's about he, the, maybe there's more restriction at the beginning while you're doing the intensive healing, but then you need some sanity. You need some balance about how you're going to live your life, but you have to understand the, the influences on your health that you want to adopt certain healthy lifestyle pieces. And, you know, right before we got on, we were talking about, how stress comes along and, and changes people's food choices. Well, stress comes along and damages the gut. And I see this all the time about people flare with whatever's going on in their, their pain or their arthritis. You know, you see flares in diseases or symptoms that people have after something happens. And that's a very common thing as well. So learning how to become more bulletproof, you know, to the stressors in your life is going to help you. That's a lifelong thing you need to work on as well. I love that you said that because I, so I had cancer as a teenager and I didn't realize that the steroids and the, and the chemotherapy destroyed my gut. And when I was 22, I was, I had a colonoscopy at 22, right? Early detection slash not really, but healing my gut. I had reflux, I had IBS, depression, acne, all this stuff. And I had to be, I mean, I'm still gluten-free because my sister is celiac and I just feel amazing off of it. It's been nine years. I'm, I'm not going back now. But the dairy, like for the first couple of years, I couldn't have it. I couldn't eat past seven o'clock at night. And now I can have dairy here and there. I should, really shouldn't, but it's not going to kill me. And I only feel my stomach flare up like once every couple of years when I'm under a lot of stress. And that's when I know I need to back off. But it's nothing compared to 10 years ago, how rigid I had to be with enzymes and all that kind of stuff. So... Yeah, it, it, it gets better. I want to back up though. You just said something I think that a lot of people are like, wait, what? Arthritis is related to the gut. And so I want us to, I would love for you to define autoimmune conditions and signs and symptoms of them because it's really hard to get a clear diagnosis if you're going to a conventional doctor. So can, let's just, I think a lot of people are like, arthritis is connected to my gut, right? Yes. <laughs> well, you know, yes, I'm very happy to do that. And so the, the end first, just about arthritis connected to the gut, and then I'll back up, I promise. There's a lot of research. And if you're, if you're a rheumatologist, if you have arthritis and your rheumatologist doesn't know that arthritis is connected to your gut, then you actually should get a different rheumatologist because this is conventional rheumatology journals. You know, I get, I read, you know, because we're the 
the poor kid on the block sort of with a new specialty. You know, I read, I'm probably more up on the rheumatology literature than, than rheumat some rheumatologists are. And because I read all sorts of journals, but even in the rheumatology journals, there's a lot of studies showing the connection between an imbalance in your gut flora, a condition called leaky gut, um, which, so what a leaky gut, so let's back up. In your gut, there's 100 trillion, and this is about autoimmunity too, so arthritis, autoimmune diseases. Which are like psoriasis. Yeah, let me, okay, I'll back up again. So anyway, we'll come back to the gut, I promise. So let's back up about what's autoimmunity. So your immune system, we all have an immune system, and I like to think of the immune system as sort of an army. You know, it's like an army of cells that, it's, a, it's an army, and they're there to protect you. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. They have a job, and they react when they have to, and then they're supposed to go to sleep, you know, like go back to like basic, you know, and, and just not be so reactive. So they react, and then they turn off, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. So what can happen, it's a, and the, that's a healthy immune system turns on when it's supposed to and turns off when it should, and then a healthy immune system also recognizes the difference between friend and foe. It recognizes that, you know, my cells in my body are mine and they shouldn't attack it and because they belong to me. And it recognizes that there's some foreign thing that's come into the body, whether it's a toxin or an infection or something like, or damaged tissues, right? So your immune system clears out cancer cells. It clears out damaged tissues in the body. And so, so the immune system has these jobs and it's supposed to know friend from foe. Under certain circumstances, which we'll talk about in a sec, the immune system can not work right. And what does that mean? Sometimes it turns on and attacks the body, its own cells, instead when it shouldn't. So it thinks your it's a its friend is actually a foe. And so the immune system attacks itself. It's like a self allergy almost. And that's called autoimmune, immune against myself. And so what happens is depending on which organ the uh, immune system attack happens, if it's in the thyroid, you get diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If it's in the skin, you could get psoriasis. If it's in the joints, you get rheumatoid arthritis. If it's in the brain, you get multiple sclerosis. I mean, there's different, and actually there's multiple different diseases in all these organs. And so, and this is actually one of the reasons why autoimmune diseases are so behind the times. You know, in cancer, you have the American Cancer Society, which it, it's an umbrella for every kind of cancer. Well, in, uh, conventionally, every autoimmune disease has been split between different medical specialties, chopped up. So the neurologists are studying MS and the rheumatologist is studying rheumatoid arthritis and the endocrinologist takes care of the thyroid people and the gastroenterologist takes care of the Crohn's and colitis people, you know, and so everybody's in a different place. And so the money for research and the, the unification of it all, which what's really happening is there's a, an, it's an immunology problem. There's a problem with the immune system. And so what in functional medicine, the approach in functional medicine is to trigger, try to figure out the root cause of autoimmunity, right? What's the root cause? Why is the immune system not working right? You know, why? And so the other thing that could go wrong is it could turn on for a good reason, but never turn off, right? And then it's just renegade cells running around and attacking your tissues. A good example of that is like Epstein-Barr virus and, and lupus, you know, or a positive ANA and a, a condition called lupus, which is a systemic autoimmune disease where your immune system attacks every cell, like all the cells in your body, because the Epstein-Barr virus is hiding. Sometimes, I'm not saying everybody has it because of Epstein-Barr virus, but like a virus can go into one of your tissues and, it, and then your immune system is attacking that tissue to try to get at it. And actually a good case in point is, well, this wasn't autoimmune, but I, in January, I got Coxsackie, B vi I got Coxsackie vi virus from one of my kids, and I got a terrible inflammatory thyroid thing. My thyroid went crazy. The virus attacked my thyroid gland. And you can, that's one of the things that can happen, and you can end up with Hashimoto's. Thankfully, my Hashimoto's didn't come back, but, but that go that's just an example of if the virus gets stuck in there and you don't clear it, you know, the immune system can keep trying to get at it you know, and then it attacks your own tissue because the, the virus is, is hidden inside your cells. So there's all sorts of reasons this happens.
Yeah, you mentioned the Epstein Barr virus. For some reason, I feel like the med. Have you heard of the medical medium? He wrote this book, and he basically brings everything back to. I did hear about that. The Epstein Barr virus. I'm more curious why everyone believes the medical the medical medium. I mean, I haven't read the book, but it's like this phenomenon, and he goes, "It's all about the Epstein Barr virus." And I'm just like, "How does the medical medium stick?" More than <laughs> yeah, and so listen, I have people, Lyme people who think everything's Lyme, you know, so I'm more moderate than, than that. And I, I tend to think, I don't think there's any way you can say that everybody has the same thing because everybody's different. Well, and I find, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hot on this trail of like, if someone tells you it's very simple, it means they're new to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a very good saying. I like that. Like the more you learn, the more you're like, okay. Like when I first, when gluten change, going off gluten changed my life in the beginning, I was like, everyone should do this. And, and even though I think a lot of people, when they, by the time they come to me, it would benefit. Not everyone needs, in my opinion, to follow the same diet that I'm doing. But at the beginning I was like, this is the answer. And I'm, I'm just so humbled by how complex the healing. Right. And that the gluten free is a, is an important part. And and we'll, we'll, for autoimmunity, it, it definitely is in general, but there's a lot of a, a whole big story to gluten as we know. But I think, did I, so you think that answers about what autoimmunity is? So in yeah. general, that's what autoimmunity is. And so we, we look for root cause. So in functional medicine, we're, we're the whole person, you know, instead of cutting up into specialties, it's really, you know, holistic. We're really looking at the whole person and looking at how to connect all those dots and figure out, well, what's the trigger for the immune system? Now, it turns out that 70% of the immune system rests in the, in, in the gut lining, like in the, in the intestinal system. So in, in your small and large intestine, on the other, you know, it's like a tube that's supposed to be a closed, a closed tube. On the inside of your body, right below the surface, is 70% of your immune system living in these clusters called Peyer's patches, and it's called the GALT, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And that's where your immune cells are laying in wait to develop. It's like little military bases. And as soon as a foreign, they perceive a foreigner, they go to action and they replicate and they, they sort of mount an immune response. But the other really important thing that they make in, those, in your gut is these cells that regulate everything, they're called your T regulator cells. And they turn, they help turn things off when it, when your immune system turns on, the T regulators turn it off. And it turns out in autoimmunity, as well as in arthritis, the T regulators aren't working that well. And what helps the T regs work right is your gut flora. Really good, 100 trillion bacteria that live in your gut. They are like what's in yogurt, lactobacillus, bifidus, and really good studies on this. In my new book, I spend a whole, I review all the literature on the uh, connection between the microbes in your gut and your immune system, the microbes in the food you're eating, you know, all that stuff, and really good research. So this is not, you know, when conventional docs say, well, we're practicing evidence-based medicine, <laughs> and I say, well, no, you're not, because you're not reading the evidence. You know, what, what I'm doing is practicing evidence-based medicine, and you know, and so we have to, the gut is really, really important. And so there's, a, so like the other thing I just want to put, say for view, listeners, is that in addition to, so you want to have a healthy gut, microbes, right? All those bacteria. And what can go wrong, and, and you want to have a, a really good barrier function between the inside of your gut and what's in, and your body, right? The intestinal lining, it's called, needs to be a barrier. So what you, you know, you bring the outside world into your mouth every day, right? That's your biggest exposure. It all comes in, you know, buy a little, and if you eat raw food like sushi, you're eating, you're bringing in a lot of live little critters into your, into your stomach. And so you bring the outside world in every day. There's toxins and pesticides and, and, and live things and mold on the fruit, you know, and your whole, your, your gut has to sort of take care of that. And you want to have a barrier between what comes in and the inside of your body, because you don't want that all just drifting willy nilly, you know, just easily into your body because your immune system will be overrun with a lot of foreign looking things, which is what happens in autoimmunity. Because in autoimmunity and arthritis, the barrier function is damaged. The barrier of the gut, the lining gets damaged and you get a condition called leaky gut. And that's one of the things that gluten does. So in addition to its role in just triggering an immune response in susceptible people, gluten, and the other big thing that really damages the gut lining is this compound called glyphosate, you know, Roundup. Have you been reading about that? 
Yeah, yeah. So wait, before you, I'm so excited you're going to go into gluten, but so just if someone's experiencing autoimmune symptoms, just yes. they do have leaky gut, even if they're not bloated, they could be having joint pain and migraines and their poop could be regular. But right. That- and that's a really good point. And so I, all my autoimmune people, well, I want, let's we'll talk about symptoms of autoimmunity and then is your gut okay? And you have to assume your gut's not. And even though I do stool testing on everybody that comes in and People, people be like, but my gut's fine. Why am I doing a stool test? I'm like, well, because I want to see what's going on. And if you have, you know, chances are there's going to be some hidden things in there, even if you don't have symptoms. And 95% of the time, you know, there's definitely something going on in the gut. You know, there's definitely an overgrowth of candida or bad bacteria. These are conditions called dysbiosis. Sometimes I find parasites, sometimes a lot of yeast. And sometimes what are called harmful microbes, potentially harmful microbes, and they're particularly there are certain categories of microbes that can over, can become overgrown. They're like weeds in the garden. You know, we use the analogy of the inner garden. A lot of people use that analogy. It's helpful, you know, because you can think of the harmful bacteria and microbes as weeds, and you need to you need to get rid of the weeds in order for the flowers to be vibrant and healthy. You also need to have healthy soil and that's sort of the, the lining and what you're feeding yourself and the ner- the environment, the microenvironment in the gut and that's where stress and food come, right? So the terrain has to be, you know, that, that your lifestyle will, ta- will help the good flowers grow. And so if you have an autoimmune condition, there's some that are obvious, like you might have joint pain, but often some people come in and they just never felt right after they were sick. You know, they had a virus, a terrible viral illness or travelers, something happened after they traveled. And so infections can definitely trigger a latent imbalance in the body and, and sort of start the process that doesn't stop. But so fatigue, really bad, be feeling really tired, difficulty concentrating and brain fog. These are signs you might have a leaky gut in addition to, and you might not have any autoimmune markers in the blood work, you know, when you go to your doctor, but if you don't do something, you might be on the road to ending up with something, you know, with autoimmune issues. And so, but so the sort of things where no one can figure out what's wrong with you, you know, where the doctor checks you for anemia and all the obvious conventional things and, and nobody can figure it out. Autoimmunity can also, especially systemic autoimmune thing, conditions like lupus and Schrogren's and things like that, you can end up with muscle, you know, joint pain, muscle pain, Anything that's sort of chronic and doesn't go away, feeling really uncomfortable in your body for some reason, any kind of pain anywhere. And definitely like headaches, maybe, but I don't even know that headaches are so much, but I think of it more like even mood stuff like anxiety and health anxiety and brain fog and can concentrate and really bad fatigue. I mean, those sort of things and definitely joint pain and muscle pain. So I think those would be, you know, the most obvious things. And sometimes people will just say, I just don't feel right. Something is not right with me. And, and you trust that. Because a lot of times if they go to a conventional doctor, they might just say, oh, you have autoimmune illness. Hey, there's nothing in the blood work. And yet, you know, I was at a cookout last night or this weekend, and it was a very traditional psychiatrist who is here in Pittsburgh. And she was saying, she talked about heavy metals and how it's very rare for people to have heavy metal toxicity. And I said, well, is it rare or, or is no one testing for it? Because I think it's probably a lot more common. And she's like, I don't know, you know, and, and I know that's part of your protocol is, is heavy metals. We're kind of jumping around, but my point is, is that a lot of conventional doctors aren't testing for this stuff. So they're going to think that they're not, they don't know what they don't know or what they don't know what. Right. And that also reminds me a very common thing that happens is people come in and they'll say, I went to my conventional doctor. Here's my blood work. I'm, everything's good. You know, I had my checkup. I no, nothing. I'm good. And I'm go, I look at it and I say, well, they tested three things, and in those three things, you're good. But there's about like 25 other things that are part of my annual routine blood work that I don't know if you're good. But, you know, so what they tested for, they're good. And so they'll say, my doctor didn't find anything, and so there's nothing wrong with me. Well, you know, if they only tested for three things, then they didn't, you're not, those things aren't wrong with you. So I think it is really important to make sure that, like you said, keep going. You know, yeah, if, with your gut, right? <laughs> with your gut. No, keep going. And if you know something's not right, you, you keep going. And, and at the very least, though, you can start to treat yourself. 
So yeah, this let's is talk about that. Through today, right? Is you don't need if you can find an integrative or functional medicine doctor or something like that. You know, great. But you can. There's a lot of us functional medicine folks who have written books to help you get started, right? And that's sort of how you found me, and I'm here talking. But because not there aren't that as much of us as there are people who need us, right? So books are a good place to start. And one of the things that makes functional medicine so amazing is, from me, from my perspective is not only are we trying to figure out root cause, and we look at things like metals, and we have different ways of testing metals, and we look at the gut, and we have different ways of testing the gut. But we're very, very much focused on using lifestyle medicine to help uh, as the core foundation of the treatment programs. And lifestyle medicine is what you're eating and how you're living your life. Emotions, thoughts, feelings, you know, mind, body, how that's connected, helping get that, helping not only treat an imbalance that might be in that system, in the stress system, but also helping people learn tools and teaching tools for how to eat, how to have better balance in your life and stressing why that's important, you know? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about food because you started to talk about gluten. And I also liked how it, and you distinguish, because a lot of people, I think a great first step for people is this elimination diet. Yeah. And you, I loved how you have talked about it as both a diagnostic tool and the, like a treatment. Therapeutic. It's therapeutic and diagnostic. Yeah. So can you explain that? And so people can have like something to start with. Yes, exactly. So, and, and I'm going to, and I'm tying, I'll tie this into the beginning of our conversation, which was I view what's called an elimination diet as the way we start. And we always start that way. And, but it's not supposed to be forever. So I invite, it's an invitation to do an experiment. And I think it's a lot easier for people to sort of adopt this or so sometimes it can be very overwhelming to look and say, Oh my God, how am I going to do that? And so I always say, look, plan for it, take your shopping list, make a start date. We do it for three weeks. So the three weeks is sort of the minimum amount of time to let your immune system cool down before testing the foods again. And so the goal is to remove a list of foods that are the most triggering foods for most people. And the classic ones are gluten, dairy, soy, corn, eggs. I mean, that's the top five. And with that, it's processed sugar, processed flour. It's, it's quality, right? Choosing health, better quality oils, choosing, you know, grass-fed organic beef. If, you can, if you're going to eat red meat, you know, look at what the animals are eating. Like, make sure that any animal food you're eating that you're choosing, you know, you're, you're paying attention to what those animals were fed because that comes into your body. So cleaning things up. Right, so cleaning up the processed food and that kind of stuff, but in addition to just eliminating these food groups, so there's a, there is a certain amount, of, and then that's lifelong. You know, getting really paying attention to your processed food consumption as well as paying attention to the quality of the the actual food you're choosing is something that that remains lifelong, and that's a permanent change that you have to start making now because sugar is inflammatory in the body. It facilitates the growth of the wrong bacteria in your gut, as well as the feedlot animals, you know, beef also facilitate bad bacteria in your gut, as well as are inflammatory in the body. So those are things you want to limit. That's lifelong. That being said, the elimination diet part is testing you for food sensitivities, right? So there's a general cleanup and then there's testing you. And that's the 21 day program where we make this list of foods that you remove. Now, the reason why we call it therapeutic and and um, diagnostic is because therapeutic because the majority of people feel better when they take those foods out and you might not re you might you, most people will say oh i don't i'm fine my digestive system is fine i don't have food sensitivities why would i grow up i could eat anything my whole life How? and so what i would invite anyone listening to contemplate is that you might not know that you could feel better and so sometimes you take those foods out and, you, and your head gets clearer and you're remembering people's names and you didn't realize you were forgetting them. And, you know, all of a sudden you're looking, you know, you're, you know your energy is great and you're looking and all of a sudden it's 7, 8 o'clock at night and you're still going strong and you didn't realize, you know, that you were getting tired at 4 or 5 o'clock. You know, like things all of a sudden you might not realize that you really could actually feel better or that you're, that you're having better elimination and you didn't realize it could be better. 
all those things sort of can happen. And so for the first three weeks, you eliminate those foods. And, you know, there's really other, uh, there's so many other options to eat. I mean, you know, gluten, dairy, there's so many dairy alternatives out there. There's, you know, coconut almond products. There's so many gluten-free uh, options. The other thing about corn and soy to keep in mind is that one of the reasons I think, well, I think probably a lot of people feel better taking corn and soy out. And I think that there's, it's one of two reasons. Either they have a true sensitivity to those foods or there's other aspects of those foods that are giving them trouble. So soy and corn are the highest pesticide-laden foods that we have in terms of this glyphosate and Roundup. And people have terrible digestive symptoms from just that. And, and they're the most highly genetically modified foods. And so GMO soy and corn, because they're genetically modified to resist the Roundup pesticide, the fields of soy and corn are sprayed with like enormous amounts of Roundup because the plant is still standing strong while all the weeds are killed because the plant is bred to resist the Roundup. So those foods have an enormous amount of this compound called glyphosate, which causes leaky gut and damages the, your gut. And so, and so I don't know whether it's a true soy corn allergy or, or sensitivity, wh why people feel better when they take it out and then worse when they eat it. But soy, uh, So that's the one reason why soy and corn need to come out. The other reason is that if you look at processed food and you look at a box of macaroni and cheese, you know, or you look at, you know, muffin mix, you know, I don't know, I'm picking just things off the top of my head. People that eat processed foods or just regular crackers even, like Ritz crackers, you'll see that there's corn syrup solids and sometimes in fake proteins, there's like soy protein isolates or soy this, you know, there's processed corn and soy in all processed foods. It sort of makes up the groundwork, you know, and the, and of the, for those foods. And, and so you're getting a lot more soy and corn than you think. And so when people, when we ask people to remove soy and corn, they have to become a label reader all of a sudden. And, and all of a sudden, 80% of the processed foods from their diet come out. And the, and the education that you're going to get when you try to take all the soy and corn out of your diet is priceless. <laughs> if you're not like, oh my God, what's happening to our food supply? For shock right. and awe. It's shock and awe. And you went to IAN and these are the kinds of things you learned at, at IAN and, and, and the, the videos, right, of, the, of the, the way they feed the chickens. And I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable, the food supply. And so you have to become an educated consumer of what you're eating. You have to know what's in the food, all the ingredients. And so doing an elimination diet forces you to look at every ingredient, and you will not look at food the same. And so it's a great, you might go, you might still eat those foods sometimes. I'm sure you will. But the education you're going to get and, you, and, and how different you're going to feel by switching over to a whole foods diet that doesn't have lists of ingredients like that in the food, you're just going to feel a lot better. And, and I want to circle back with the glyphosate. You were talking about that with gluten too. So for people, yes. you may not have celiac disease or gluten intolerance, but again, this glyphosate, especially if, if you have gut issues, you're probably not detoxing as well, which means that stuff gets stored in you. So just because you get a celiac blood test and they say, you, you don't need to stay away from gluten or, you know, you're fine. You're saying eliminate it for three weeks and, and then add it back are in. You, are you talking about people who don't have celiac, they test yes. negative. Yeah, yeah, testing so, negative for celiac. Yeah, testing negative for celiac. So gl coming back to gluten then, gluten is its own story, as we know. There's so many books and everything. But gluten is its own story, and for these reasons, gluten is associated with autoimmunity, right? It, it causes celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition, and gluten is associated. There's really good article, you know, articles that have been written looking at the data about how gluten is associated with other autoimmune diseases as well. And so you must... You know, anyone who has any autoimmunity needs to take gluten out because it's a trigger for the immune system. Your immune system responds to it. Now, the, the food supply is different than it ever was before. So there's a lot more. There's 42 gluten proteins now in the wheat, and there used to be seven. And that's just hybridization over the years. Our wheat is just different than the ancient wheats that our ancestors ate. And so there's just a lot more gluten than we're exposed to. And wheat is also doused pretty well with glyphosate, you know, with Roundup. And so what I would say is, um, so that's the first thing about about gluten in general. The other thing is there's something called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, NG, um, wait, non, NCGS, 
and it actually has a name now. It's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and I think it was Alessio Fasano, who was the original leaky gut researcher, the gastroenterologist, showing the mechanism for how leaky gut happens. I think he's the one who wrote that article. Could be wrong, but a really good, really though, you know, a bona fide new emerging new diagnosis, and it just means that because celiac, because gluten comes into the body and people react to it. And part of it is a gut reaction. Sometimes it's a gut reaction, but sometimes it's a systemic reaction. It's just triggering inflammation in the body. And inflammation just means that, you know, your immune system is reacting and it's sending out these chemicals that are zipping around the body, causing irritation. And so inflammation means redness, swelling, pain, and heat. And if it, so if you see it on your joints, you see it, it's red, swollen, hot, you know, and it hurts. But if it's in the organs or on the inside of your body, it just, it just impairs the functioning of that tissue. It's just an irritation that feels, you don't feel good. And that's just how inflammation feels inside you where you can't see it. And gluten triggers inflammation and it, it triggers an immune reaction in a lot of people. And so you have to remove it to see. And so, for, so, that's, so the therapeutic part is three weeks you take these foods out and you see how you feel. And I always tell people, you might not notice that you feel better. And maybe you won't. Maybe you're like, you know, I know some people come in and say, I don't really know if I feel any better. And, I, and so I always invite them to hold their judgment until they start reintroducing the foods because you might not realize you feel better, you felt better until you reintroduce the food and it triggers a symptom. And so what the program's doing, the elimination diet, is it's going to, taking all, everything out, <sighs> everything calms down in your body, right? Your immune system calms down, your inflammation levels go down, and it sort of gets you ready to have a, an, like a heightened reaction when you eat the food again. So when you go back then, and the first, let's say the first thing after three weeks, I miss my gluten, I want to eat some wheat, and you eat gluten a couple of times that day and the next day and you know it's just pour and you just watch what happens you if you have gluten sensitivity you're going to trigger an immune reaction to the body that you're going to feel and the goal is to feel it strongly you know because so that you're aware of it and that's what when we talk about that it's um, diagnostic so it's therapeutic to see if you feel better but then we want to diagnose food sensitivities and that's how you do it and every three days you reintroduce the next food on your list if you have a reaction you have to take the food out again and wait until the reaction goes away and then try the next food and you just sort of roll your way through reintroduction i always tell people the data well, this is an experiment and the data collection happens in the part one but especially in part two and before I get off this topic and pause, because I know I'm just going on and on, I do want to just say that sometimes you might, there are people who are going to do elimination diet and not feel, not be able to identify anything. Maybe like I felt, didn't notice a difference when I removed it and I didn't notice a difference when I reintroduced it. And if that happens to you, then chances are you have something else going on that's just masking everything. Right, so if your gut is in really bad shape, bad dysbiosis, severe leaky gut, and you're not working on your, and the gut work hasn't been done yet, you know, the healing the gut part is not underway. Until you heal your gut, you might not be able to notice. You're not going to feel better even from removing foods, you know. So sometimes that happens. If you know, if something else is going on, if you're in the middle of a viral illness or something, and you do an elimination diet, you might not notice you feel better. Because there's outside triggers. And so a way to think of, you know, so it's just there are other, there are other, God, I heard, I love this new way. I used to always talk about sitting on tax, you know, removing tax and seeing, finding the tax and removing them. I heard one of my colleagues say, if you're in a building and there's like, and the roof's leaking and the water's pouring inside and you're inside the building and you find a couple of holes and plug them, unless you find all the pl holes to plug them, it's still going to rain in, inside. Mm -hmm. Right. And so food, you might have some of those holes are related to food, but while you have all this other holes in the roof, it's still raining and you're not going to be able to determine the food. So I would invite you to take a look at your gut, especially, and work on a gut healing program. I do have an online resource for you to heal your gut at BlumHealthMD.com. You can go there and I have a whole heal my gut program, but make sure you go back later on and do the elimination diet again because you have to once your gut is healed or you've done some gut healing work go back and see whether or not to test your food sensitivities again 
I love that. So I want to leave some time so I can talk, we can talk about the emotional and spiritual stuff. But yeah, yeah. I, so I'm just going to ask you a couple quick questions about the yes. healing part. That will be quick, quick. So when people are healing, do you recommend like pre and probiotics right away? Or is there a rate of introduction? Or can they just go at them, which will help restabilize that gut biome? For healing the gut, I always recommend you start out with some sort of a weed killer. And I, uh, that's just the easiest way to say it. So, and I use herbs. And so I have like favorite products, right? But they're, they're tried and true herbs that are out on the market and that supplement companies have to clean out sort of the bad bacteria and the yeast. I use a lot of oregano. I use a lot of berberine, you know, and I use it in products, you know, like I like GI Microbex from Designs for Health. That's the one I use and, and I have packets I use them in with oregano. And so you can find, you know, gut clean, you know, sort of gut cleanse sort of herbs that have things like, and I talk about this, this is like I give all the or different kind of herbs in my book and, you know, the immune system recovery plan, that book that's out already. I have a whole healing my gut. Oh, actually, on my website, on Blum Health MD, if you go to the, immune, the book, the immune system recovery plan page, I have a free download for the whole chapter, healing your gut. So awesome. the, whole ch- the whole chapter is a free download and it'll talk about all the herbs. But anyway, the f- step one, so it'll explain to you all this and, and it, yeah, so it's all there. But so that's the quickest way. But first, so to answer your question, in functional medicine, healing the gut is a multi-stage process. The first R, it's the five R, the five R program. So the first R is remove. And that's where you remove the food. So that's the elimination diet. But you have to remove the bad actors that are in the gut. And that's what you need the herbs for, right? Clean it, remove the bad bacteria and yeast. So you have to do that first. It's sort of like if your garden is overgrown with weeds, you can't just plant flowers and think the weeds are going to just go away. You have to weed the garden in order to really get your good stuff in there. So, so that's the first thing. So treat your gut with some sort of herbal program. I always use probiotics, especially uh, probiotics not only are great for helping restore the gut bacteria, but really food is the best thing to help you restore your gut bacteria, which we'll talk about. But probiotics have an immune function. They actually, when you take probiotics, it reduces inflammation in the body. It helps heal your leaky gut. It increases your functioning of those T regulator cells that are really important, reduces inflammation in the body. Studies, really good studies just on pro- take, people taking probiotics and how it changes your immune function. Do so, you think everyone in the West, even if we're relatively healthy, should be taking probiotics given... I think, I think if you're healthy and you don't have any immune issues, you do not need to take probiotics. Okay. But, I think, but you need to be eating probiotic foods. foods yeah. So you need to eat cultured foods, which is, I eat coconut yogurt. I put coconut yogurt in my shakes in the morning. And so you can, I don't do, I don't believe in cow dairy. I think it's very inflammatory. It doesn't agree with me. Some people can tolerate it. And yogurt is the best choice as far as I'm concerned, because dairy is on the alkaline acid spectrum. It's a very acid kind of food in the body and how it behaves in the body. And so I'm not big on dairy, but I think there's a lot of cultured milks that you can do, you know, cultured almond yogurt, cultured coconut products, and there's fermented food. So there's kimchi and there's pickled radishes that I, you know, you can having a whole crowd and, and there's kombucha. Yeah, yeah, you can bring kombucha tea. And so I, I think that rather if you're generally healthy, I don't and you you just need to attend to your gut microbiome by eating cultured and fermented foods, which cultures peoples all around the world, there are cultures where they have that as staples in their diets. I mean the Middle East they have yogurt. You know, India they eat yogurt, you know, they live with yogurt and and God knows there's parasites and crazy stuff in India. <laughs> I yeah. never went there. I know I've been there and I treat people when they come back. But I think food and fiber and colorful fruits and vegetables, they grow the good bacteria. So, but if you're a person that has any kind of immune issue, if you get, if you find you're getting sick a lot, you know, even just getting sick a lot, like I get a cold all the time, probiotic is really good for that. If you have digestive issues, you know, probiotic won't necessarily, you know, food is going to be the first thing for reflux and like an elimination diet is a perfect way to test your set to try to help. Your, your reflux to see why you're getting reflux. Um, gluten and dairy, I think, are the number was one and two culprits, you know? Yeah, reflux. I was just wondering if you thought because of that terrain, I always think get the probiotics and prebiotics in there. Yeah, so let's talk about prebiotics for a second. Food or food, I believe. Um, oh, I, yeah, I, I am talking, right, so I am talking about prebiotics. Yes, prebiotics in the form of food. 
And that's just all your fruits and vegetables and fiber. And so, yes, prebiotics in that form. There's sort of an epidemic of this gut condition called SIBO. I don't know if you've been digging into that. I but have. One of the functional forums I went to, they were kind of now toying with, do we not treat it and just crowd, at, crowd it out? with all the good stuff because this was in New York two years ago. I don't know yeah. if you were at that one, but they were saying- I've been there, yeah, I know. Yeah. Sometimes the antibiotics can be worse if the terrain isn't really strong in the body. And they were, they were postulating the question of, do we treat SIBO or do we just try to crowd it out with all the good stuff? Right, well, well sometimes SIBO, is, so just what SIBO, small intestinal oh, yeah. bacterial overgrowth, Normally, 90% of the bacteria is supposed to be in the large intestine and only 10% in your, in your small intestine. So that's the normal spread in the intestines. SIBO is when you might have normal bacteria, but they're just congested up in the small intestine right after your stomach. They're in the, they're in the small bowel where they shouldn't belong. And those are people who have bloating and gas and just respond. The foods they eat trigger all these reactions because all these bacteria are there where they shouldn't be ready to ferment those foods and make gas. Those are normal bacteria for the colon often, right? So often they're just your normal flora. They're in the wrong place mm. and, and they're overgrowing and you have too much of them. And the problem is that they can impair, cause digestion and absorption issues in the small intestine. You can get malabsorption of your nutrients from having SIBO. And some people, gosh, I've had some patients who couldn't leave their house because they were, they were passing so much gas and they were having so many like loose stool. Some, some people have diarrhea from it. Some people have constipation. And I've had some people who were so uncomfortable that they needed treatment. But I agree with you. Some people, but, and then I have some people where the SIBO is contributing to their leaky gut as part, and they will have autoimmunity or arthritis and they have SIBO. And so in those cases, I do go ahead and treat them. People who are asymptomatic, like have no symptoms and, and our immune systems always seems okay, Sometimes we'll let that not do any kind of aggressive treatment because conventionally they're treated with antibiotics. I use the same herbs for SIBO that I use for dysbiosis. So it's, I'm not really you know, causing any damage. But what I want to say is from root cause medicine, which is functional medicine, you have to figure out why someone has SIBO. Why do you have SIBO, right? So the answer is to find out why you have it. Otherwise, it'll still keep coming back. And, and sometimes the biggest culprit is stress. And I know well, let's, that we need to dig into stress a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. One question, the, biggest, the biggest, biggest culprit is stress. Yeah. One more question on the physical piece of the physical stress is when someone's healing and they're getting better and better and then they have a slip up. I mean, how do you, what's your philosophy on that? I'm kind of like, okay, use that as a reminder <laughs> of how bad you feel and to keep going. And, and like you said, real life. But I'm curious, you know, I, I tend to think like a little bit of inflammation isn't as bad as like the whole cake, right? Like a little is Oh, a absolutely. I think that if as their coaches, you know, you're a coach, I'm a coach also while I'm, I'm doing everything, you know, but I'm coaching, right? And my job, like your job, and I know you believe this, we, sp we talked about this before, is to meet people where they are. And you can't, if you hold such high, people are, if you hold such high, a high bar, and tell people you expect them to be 100%, not only will they feel like they failed, and when that happens, sometimes they just give up. They throw the whole towel in and just don't even, you know, and just come back and say, I just gave up because I couldn't do it. And, and sometimes they won't come back and see you because they feel ashamed because you gave them this whole sort of expectation that was unrealistic. And so I actually, I never, I encourage people to be 100% if they can for the eliminate three weeks of the elimination diet because... You need to be 100% for us to be able to collect the data, right? You're not, if, you, if you cheat along the way, you're not going to be able to see if the food triggers you after three weeks. You know, when you, the reintroduction part of the, after the 21 days are up, the reintroduction part is not as effective. You know, you, don't, you can't really know if, you're, if you have a food sensitivity unless you really are 100% for three weeks. So that's the only time when I'm really, and if people come back and they say, I really couldn't do it, I'm like, fine. So we won't have that information. We just don't know. You know, because, you, you know, that's, you know, and I try to encourage them at some point maybe to try again, but coming to what you said, you're not going to throw it all away if you go to a wedding like I did on Saturday night and eat whatever you want. 
You're not going to. And, and you have to live life and have fun. Oh, God, I felt I was so hungover on Sunday. I felt so sick. Okay. <laughs> and I had, I had French fries. I mean, I really ate everything. Um, I mean, I'm way down the road on this. And the, but the trick is to not do that too often because then your whole baseline can start going up again. One, one day like that, and you'll just really feel crummy the next day. You have to be clean, clean, clean. I actually, Monday and Tuesday, I did a juice cleanse, you know, <laughs> for two days. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm involved with this company called Organic Farmer. And so I, I, it's all 100% organic, low sugar. I helped design all the, with the chefs, you know, all the food. And so I know that they're really good, clean, you know, juices. But, you know, the, I rebooted myself you know, to get back on track and I, and to make, to just clean that out and to make sure that I didn't continue. So one night is fine every couple of weeks, but, or even, you know, it depends on how far along you are in your process. If you're years and years and years and you're generally healthy and feeling good, it could even be a little bit once a week. You know, and that's fine. Saturday nights, go out to dinner, you know, cheat a little bit, but you have to go back to, being really good, you know, to really maintaining your vigilance on the other days because you can slip back into bad habits very easily. So I definitely allow the 90% rule after they're healed. Okay. So, so there's, you can't, you know, the 90%, but, and so. What about in the healing phase though? Right. In the healing. Yes. I was going to say, so where are we with that? So it depends on how, I, I guess I just have to say it depends on how sick you are for people listening. If you're really, really sick and you're so, and you're suffering, you really want to be as close to 100% as you can because you'll feel better. You know, you don't want to take the chance of, of not feeling good, but you'll know. And so this is a bit of a process, right? Because so you'll know that you can test yourself as you go. So let's say you start a program and three months into it, or after the 21 days you reintroduce and you realize that gluten and dairy and corn are the three foods that give you like your hands swell the next day. Or I had a patient who whose feet, she couldn't get, she had terrible pain on the bottom of her feet when she stepped out of bed in the morning, right? Corn was the culprit. And you realize that something, you identify a food trigger. You want to remove those foods as best you can for three months, right? Now, if you eat that food, you're going to notice, and, and you probably will. So let's say you go, to, you go out and you have some gluten or something. See what happens, you know, and you might find that after, while you're still in the early phases of your healing, you're going to have symptoms for three days from cheating. Well, I don't even want to call it cheating, from eating foods that you know you're sensitive to. You might have symptoms for like three days. Whereas now, for me, I'm years in, I, I'll just have symptoms for a day, you know, and so that's a sign that I have more resilience in my body. My terrain is in a better place. I'm not as sensitive to that food as I once was. And so your food sensitivity will, will get better as your gut gets healthier and as you move your body to a healthier overall place. And so I would say that at the beginning of your journey, you want to not try to limit the time, you know, really restrict the food as much as you can and slowly but surely you, like, you can see how you feel each time you eat it to see how bad your reaction is. And if it stays pretty bad, then you need to still cut it out. How's that for an answer? I, I love that. But I think this is a great bridge to the stress because in my work, I see how stress, emotional stress, people know they're feeling better, but then they also don't know how to cope with the emotional stress in their life. And so it's, and I see it a lot about emotional safety. So it's like, I know I'm going to feel physically bad, but risking my emotional safety right now feels worse. I mean, this is all unconscious until it's brought conscious, but you were saying stress is so important. And I'm curious about your beliefs around how much of, especially autoimmune, which I always look on an emotional level, what's the metaphor here, right? How are we emotionally attacking ourselves? If the body's physically attacking ourselves, how much, I mean, we've spent a, a good portion on the food and I feel like that is something concrete for people, right? So that we want to grasp onto that. But you're, you also, like you said, cut your teeth in mind-body medicine. So what is your view on equal weight to the emotional and spiritual? And, and my client who, and totally, you know, you've changed her life. She's like, I want to know because I've also noticed as I deal with the ghosts from my pasts, things seem to get better, even if the food is still a little wonky. And so she's like, I'd love to know what Dr. Blum thinks. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I actually think there's probably equal weight to both. Mm -hmm. And and I've gosh, I have so many stories in my head that I could share. I mean, I 
I find that people flare, you know, I, I find my patients flare with symptoms when they have stressors and tra anything traumatic or difficult, just a parent gets sick and ends up dying and, and the, all the progress, the gut goes wonky again. I mean, the stress has a huge effect on the gut, but I hear what you're saying about stress influences your food choices. You know, it influences, you know, you want to choose those comfort foods. You don't want to. I just actually had a, a very, one of my Sjogren's patients I've been working with for a while. I spoke to her yesterday and she did so, her husband was so sick for so long and she's still stuck with like really taking good care of herself and that now her daughter has an abusive husband and she's going through that and she just lost, she just, she said, I, 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 I'm in, my symptoms are flaring again and I'm just been eating off the wagon. I just can't. I can't do it anymore. I just lost it, you know? And so her resilience was probably so like it was there, but it was depleted at the same time. Her resilience wasn't, she wasn't completely resilient yet, but she, the, the stress just, I was surprised that she stayed so well during the first traumatic thing that she went through with her husband. And so I, I just, you have to, I guess for people listening, the message really is to, I want you to understand the importance of what you're going through and how that's affecting your physical body. And just give it a nod. Give it accept. Just understand that, you know. And when I give lecture, like my, I, I, I now one of the things I always say is, okay, who here knows that stress is really important? And everybody raises their hand. And then I say, well, so who here really knows and is really doing something about it? How are you emphasizing this with your patients? How are you doing this with yourself? Are you really attending to the the issue of stress in your life? And like a quarter of the people raise their hands. So we all know it intellectually. And it's really, but it is really, really that important. And so I think that we have to really put a practice into our lives that, well, it's about, it's more than that. It's about cultivating some way every day to have a daily practice of some sort to turn the, to turn the stress off. So there's, there's two aspects to the mind-body connection and the effects of stress on your health. One is the actual physical response of your body to a stressor, right? So there's stressors are around us. It's you, somebody gets sick, a kid calls you at three o'clock in the morning at the police station. I had that. I have three sons. Each one, each, each one did that to me once. You know? <laughs> We're guessing how resilient your gut was, right? <laughs> there's nothing, you know, but that's a stress response. So, you know, we have, and, and there's all sorts of reasons why everybody is going to have traumatic things happen. Everybody's going to have stressors happen. And those of you with, and people with autoimmune disease or any kind of chronic illness, look, you went through something really stressful. You know, it's very, very hard to, you have to acknowledge, like I acknowledge for people all the time that, you know, they come out of that almost, almost like a PTSD with, with health anxiety. I mean, it's everything becomes a worry. And so there's always opportunity. There's plenty of opportunity of stressors in our lives. And then the question is, how are you going to live in a perpetual on switch where your stress response is the fight or flight, they call it, right? The fight or flight system is activated and stays on all the time. I guess that's when you think of the immune system, autoimmunity, the immune system staying on, well, you could have your stress system just staying on. You need to find a way to regulate it and to turn it off. And so everybody has to, and this is a conversation I have with every, every, everybody in my office. Every time I see everybody, so what are we doing? You know, how's your mind-body practice? What have you decided to do? And sometimes I give them links to apps and I, we brainstorm. If you commute on the train, you can listen to your app. And, you know, like, what would you like to do? Do you want to do something more moving? Do you want to do yoga? Do you want to do meditation? And I give them resources for learning. I give CDs. I give downloads for – we have a Learn to Relax kit on our website, you know, that on my website that, you know, has a C MP3 guided thing, you know, it's just, it's that important. So the first thing is recognizing that it is that important, staying in the on switch and, and accepting that it's part of everybody. And we all have to find a way you cannot get around this. You will stress in your life. If you allow your stressors to come into your body, they will make you sick. They will affect your immune system. They will, they can cause other symptoms other than autoimmunity, but it can contribute to that and it triggering inflammation. And then indirectly, because physically stress will damage the gut. It causes leaky gut all by itself, stress hormones. It changes your gut flora all by itself. 
It causes reflux. It causes SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because it decreases the motility of your gut. It's like if you have chronic constipation or lack of motility through the gut, the bacteria get jammed up in the small intestine. And so stress is a huge component to that. So there's all sorts of ways that I can go through and prove, and we can all understand it intellectually. But you know, as coaches, right, we have to not only walk the walk ourselves, I meditate every morning, but like I walk my dog, I leave the phone home, you know, I go out and out with the dog. And so, you know, you have to set an intention that to, that this is that important and you won't get better. And so sometimes in somebody's healing journey, they're getting better, better, and we're working on healing the gut and the stool tests are improving and everything's going great. And that then, and there's some reason that they're not, you know, using a football metaphor, you know, you're on, you're in field goal range, but you're not, you're not in the end zone yet, you know, no touchdown. What's that last piece? And, and 90% of the time it's stress. There's that, that emotional piece, the emotional, they're falling into some emotional eating or they're falling into some, they're not, there's just stressors that they're, they're just bringing in that are con- that preventing them from full recovery or, or full you know, health. The other thing that mind-body medicine does are these mind-body practices like meditation. So they're going to help antidote and give you the bulletproof vest, right, for your physical health. But they also provide tools for self-awareness. We all are, I was going to say we're all alone. I mean, we're not all alone, but you know, you know what I mean. Like we're all, we all are in charge of our own health. We're all in charge of our path through life. We're all, it's a journey where each individual is on. And how do you know what comes next? How do you know how to navigate? How do you know what choice to make with a health decision you might have? How do you know? And I believe we all have an intuition, right? There's an intuitive voice that helps us all know what to do next. You know, decisions, whether it's about health or family or anything. And finding some practice every day or some way to quiet your mind so you could get in touch with your own intuitive voice, which is what happens when you quiet the noisy mind that's busy talking to you and, and making just a lot of distraction. These practices, these meditative mind-body practices can help quiet your mind so you can hear your inner voice. It's I call it your inner North Star. And in order to navigate through our healthcare system through getting better from having chronic illness, you know, what comes next, staying, being able to notice when your emotions are getting the better of you, you know, and you're making those choices. And sometimes you say, damn it, I'm just going to eat that anyway. I know I'm making an emotional choice. I don't care. I feel like having it. And I believe you should eat it then. I'm, I'm like fine with that. But in the, it's still having coming back, somehow you have to reground yourself and you need tools for that so that you don't completely fall off, you know, and that you're mind, mindful as you're doing it. So mindful choices. And so it's been my experience that to really, really stay on the path and uh, finish what you start, the mind-body piece and understanding your own sort of the way your own emotions and mind works to trigger food choices or to trigger your symptoms or to trigger stress responses, you have to understand that and you have to understand it. You have to acknowledge with yourself the importance of it in your health and you have to commit to doing something about it. I love that you brought up the self-awareness piece because what I do with my clients is show how stress from the past, they're recreating their story today. I always use the quote made famous by Aaron Brockovich and Gloria Steinem that says, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. (laughs) (laughs) And how they're recreating stress. It's, and they, they have to become self-aware of how they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And then you can make a new meaning out of your health symptoms. And it can be this invitation into power and resilience. And I'm, I'm curious for you is, do you think with your Hashimoto's, it was almost a spiritual redirection or fine tunement of your path. And I find it interesting that then you got a, an, a virus at the beginning of this year, but it didn't take you down the same way because you had all this emotional resilience because you're, you're, you're on your North Star path. Right. Well, I do want to clarify one thing about that. So just so that I'm for complete um, transparency about my path, we'll do that first. The I actually got a, about a year ago, I, I got, a, I, I'm back to resilient now because I did about two years ago, I got a little arthritis and I 
panicked and I was like, oh my God, actually it was that I developed this inflammation in my eye. I got an inflammatory thing and I, I was like, what's going on? Now I had written a book. One of my kids had a traumatic brain injury. I mean, we're talking about, this is my own experience of going through several terrible, difficult years. And one of my kids had to leave school and take a gap year because he was having some emotional, you know, stress and the other kid. Um, and so, and I opened Blum Center and I was doing way too much in addition to having these family issues. And a year into this whole thing, I got this inflammation in my eye. And it was a wake-up call for me. And I realized I was having swelling in one of my fingers. And I put myself back on the program, like 150% strict. I mean, like I picked, you know, peppers out of the food. Like I was, I was just eliminating. And I took out nightshades because of my arthritis, which is tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers. And I went about healing my gut and meditating every day and recommitted. And so, yes, when I got the virus now, I was back to being resilient. But I did have, I did fall off the wagon, so to speak, from stress. So I really do, in terms of my gut, my gut went completely wonky for, because of everything I had gone through. I was still eating very healthy. So it's speaking, so to speaking to what you had said about, I think you said this earlier that eating fine, but stress, but the, you could be doing the food plan just fine and really being clean with your food, but stress alone can cause autoimmunity or can cause a leaky gut and can be the only culprit. And it absolutely can. And that's what happened with me the second time around. So I didn't have an autoimmune thing. Even with the, when I said I had arthritis, it, didn't, it was not autoimmune, but I had these inflammatory symptoms. So I had not, I caught myself early, got myself back on the wagon 100%. And really, you know, I needed to heal. I needed to do gut work and I needed to really do some self awareness. I started doing acupuncture every week. You know, I really worked on my, my stress system. Like with outside, with help from, you know, with a therapist, like an acupuncturist and, and got, and really committed to, cause I got scared, you know, I could end up with rheumatoid arthritis and that's the last thing that I needed. And so I, I did. And so when I had the virus this year, I did recover very quickly and didn't end up with something, but I had already, so yes, I'm back to being resilient again, thank God, but about, but I did have a, another thing that I did have to go through and, um, and it was all stress related. But I would still think, though, it went from like bouts of it, whereas Hashimoto's is full on systemic. So even though right. I mean, you don't have any more bumps in your health, it just made- right. It was a bump, right? It wasn't so much. It wasn't like the Hashimoto's, yeah. Yeah, because you had yeah. built up all this like principal interest and right. And, no, you know, that's that's very true. So yes, the Hashimoto's. I was very I, well. That's uh, exactly. I was very resilient coming into everything I was doing. And then I went through all these things and I did have like a little bump that surfaced, but I, but it, I was able to treat it. Yeah. Pretty quickly because of the resiliency, I think of all the years of being very, you know, taking good care of myself. Seeing how miraculous the body is and your own amazing stories. What's your spiritual beliefs? What do you lock into when times do get stressful? I'm always interested because these, he- I think of you as a healer and yeah. There's a mystery. Um, well, yeah, there's, there is mystery. I guess, let me think of I don't, how I would answer that would be to say that I believe that we're all here for our own reason, you know, and that there's some, le- and that I'm here to learn lessons, like a, being a human being. I believe in reincarnation. I believe in coming back and learning and, and spiritual growth during your lifetime. And so when these things happen, I take it really seriously that I need to understand the lessons that I need to learn from it. And so, yeah, I do a lot of spiritual work too. So. I love that because I, I believe in reincarnation, but I'm going through a phrase where I'm kind of questioning it and I don't know. Well, well but there's all different ways. All it means is that, you know, you believe that there's, you, there's some place, you know, your spirit leaves somewhere and goes somewhere and it's a great mystery about where your spirit goes at the end of life and that it comes back and that i'm a spirit i'm a i am a spiritual being inside a human body and we come back and i do believe right or you know my belief is that we do choose some of the circumstances before we come in to this life so everything that i'm going through in my life in some ways you know i i'm here i knew the lessons that i would be facing you know, to potentially learn in this lifetime. And so I just tried to step up to the plate and sort of dig into that. It's like, okay, well, what do I need to learn here? And, and the nice thing about that, that approach is that it, you, it releases judgment and blame 
from the and and it allows forgiveness because the most important thing i guess my that's my spiritual belief is to is forgiveness you know because you know people this is the circumstances that they were born into and sometimes they're not going to learn their lessons in this life and you just have to let it go and there's no blame or judgment and you know some people are really trying to learn their lessons and grow from their experiences and some people you know i have family members who are, i think are just sort of stuck you know and they're not going to learn their lessons and you just have to go okay you know and so i do the best i can to learn you know to take responsibility for my own life and to encourage everyone else to do that and i'm not responsible for other people's lives and but we're here to learn. We're here to learn and, and grow. So I'm always looking for the, I guess, the silver lining around, all the, around everything. Well, I love that because for people who listen to Insatiable frequently, we talk a lot about, I talk a lot about agency and I feel like agency is an important health metric. And what you're doing is making the choice to make something really stressful, a meaningful experience. And so you're actually putting the, the you're choosing what the meaning is. And I think that's so powerful because then you can come out stronger the mm -hmm. more you went in rather than it taking you down that rabbit hole. And I think that's really important for everyone. If you're struggling with autoimmune or whatever, this could be a really big invitation into a lot of growth and you can choose to make it that if you, if you follow your gut, like you're saying. One more question, it just, it's kind of less spiritual, but do you think with, with people who are inflamed and struggling with autoimmune exercise, is there any, because movement is important, but do you think too much exercise throws them over the edge or that you can't, you don't know that for each person. I mean, I, I would just say people should only do what they feel like they should do, but they should get up and move if they can. You know, we say motion is the lotion. Um, oh, it, I like that. I've never yeah. heard your issues. Motion is the lotion for especially joints, you know, so you really want to move. Um, it is going to help you feel better. I mean, that's like the fibromyalgia arthritis people for sure. But it, I tell my patient people who are so tired that if you so let's work on the fatigue, you know, first and try to help you feel a little bit better from that. I'm not going to push you for exercise, but at least try to walk two hours a week. And I, and I, you know, just get up and walk, go for a walk, even if you can. Like, so I do think movement is, is important and it'll get your, it helps with detox. It, your lymphatic muscles sort of help move the lymphatics, which will help with your blood flow and, and your lymphatic flow, which helps clear the, t you know, the debris out of all your cells. And so you got to move. But the, the, the amount of exercise, absolutely no overdoing it if you're really, if you're really sick. There's no need to overexercise. But, but, but aiming for just two hours total a week of, of walking and some sort of you know, movement would be a good place to start. So yeah, absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, I love that. So it's like t tune into that North Star as best as you can. with Right. And do what, what your body wants. Tune into your body. And that, but that's why you have to have some way of quieting your mind. Look, for some people it's knitting, you know, uh, or needlepoint. It doesn't have to be meditation. You know, if that's not, you know, true quote unquote, like just sit and, and like, you know, and not know what to do, but sit and close your eyes. You need it. Most people that want to learn meditation, which I encourage you to do, um, you need a teacher. You know, my cousin's a Zen Buddhist. She taught me how to meditate Zen. And then I went to meditation retreats. I recommend people go to places like, well, you live in, um, where are you? Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. Now. But, you know, there are places all over the country that you can find to go to. I'm in New York, so I go to like Omega Institute. I spent every summer for 10 years, I went for a workshop there, you know, and it was some sort of a learn. I did two meditation retreats there. It's a Vipassana insight meditation training. I've done, I've gone to Kripalu, which is in Massachusetts. I mean, there's just places you can go and all communities have, you know, spiritual workshops, you know, yoga kind of places you can learn these things. So most people do need a teacher and I mean, that's really good. And so these practices will help you learn to be your own guide, you know, which is what we all need. Did you do the 10 day silent Vipassana? I've never done that. But last summer I went and I did a spiritual retreat at, um, in Northern California with her name is Gangaji. She's a, like a guru kind of a, a, a retreat. And that was a five day silent uh, retreat. And that was great. Oh, I, I love that. You see, I've been meditating a long time, but for me who lives such a noisy life and you could, you can hear, from how fast I talk, I'm a New Yorker, I'm busy, I'm doing, I'm talking. I actually crave the silence. Like going and being silent is like heaven for me. 
So to be able to spend that time just with myself is giving me the space that I really enjoy. So I like that. But I'm, I've also been meditating for 20, since I'm 35. You know, 20, how old am I now? It's 20 years I'm meditating. So, so I'm, I'm comfortable with that and I like it. You know, I enjoy, I sit down to meditate and it's like, ah, oh, you know, so that's, and everyone can get that. It's a practice though. You have to practice it. Yeah. It's just so refreshing. I know our listeners to hear a physician say, <laughs> go on a meditation or that stress matters as much as what you eat. And, and I think, I just thank you so much for, I think that channel has enabled you to pioneer and, and give us, all of us, you've thrown the rope back to say, hey, or the bridge, <laughs> you're building the bridge back for your colleagues and everything and, and all of our listeners. And I just thank you so much for your time. I know we went a little bit over. I could ask you like a thousand more questions. Of, we'll come back. I'll come back and we'll do yeah, it again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tell everyone again the name of your book and the website. Of where okay. Yep. I'll make, uh, so my website is BlumHealthMD.com. And we have free downloads of all sorts of information on there. So you can tool around and look what's going on on there. I do Facebook Live. And, oh, I have a lot of um, YouTube videos. You can go find me on the YouTube channel. I've done so many topics in Facebook Live. So there's a lot of a whole library of me talking on different topics. So that's another place they can find me. My book's The Immune System Recovery Plan. That's a couple of years now. And my newest book is in October. And we're going to be doing, I'm actually hosting an arthritis summit, which is a free online of, with, um, I'm interviewing all my colleagues in functional medicine about arthritis, and that's going to be in October as well. So a lot going on, but I think the, the you know, there's all sorts of places to find me, Facebook, you know, I, I have a whole, I'm very active on social media as well. Wonderful. And for, in the show notes, we'll have Dr. Blum's uh, website and, and background and everything. So you can also find it there. Thank you so much for your time and for your willingness to go against the grain. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you so Including much for having me. Grains. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, exactly. Well, that's true too. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. And we and definitely have to have you back. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll definitely be happy to come back. Great. Thank you. Have questions or reactions about the episode? Reach out to me on Instagram and Twitter at Ali M. Shapiro or Facebook at Facebook backslash Ali Marie Shapiro. And if you love the show, please leave an iTunes review and tell one friend this week about how to get the Insatiable podcast on their phone. See you on social media.